Well, Joe Manchin held a press conference, and he essentially initiated a game of chicken with progressives. And it's very clear that they're backing down. Joe Manchin won. Progressives at this point have lost. And now it's a matter of how embarrassed they'll be in the end of this, which is still yet to be determined. Now, to give you some back background before I show you what Joe Manchin said, progressives have, to their credit, remained committed to not supporting the bipartisan infrastructure deal unless they also vote on the Build Back Better Act, because they know that if they vote on the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which is a corporate handout that Joe Manchin and other Republicans want, then they have no leverage. They're not going to get the Build Back Better Act. So it's important that they remain committed, and they have. And Democratic Party leadership is getting increasingly impatient because they're going back on their promise to progressives. And now they're saying, mm, let's just vote on the bipartisan infrastructure, give the corporatists what they want, and then we'll revisit the Build Back Better Act later. In fact, over the weekend, Nancy Pelosi actually told members not to embarrass the president while he's overseas by voting against his bipartisan infrastructure deal because she's receiving pressure from the corporatists and they want to vote. And she now wants to give it to them because she thinks that they mean business. Progressives have absolutely no reason whatsoever to support the bipartisan infrastructure deal because it's it's useless. It's garbage. In fact, that alone does more harm to the planet overall. And AOC broke this down in a really insightful thread. And she says, passing BIF without Build Back Better makes our emissions and climate crisis worse. Sure, some BIF investments do good, but not enough. So it keeps us in the emissions red. So if progressives don't get a lot of concessions in Build Back Better, enough to offset the damage caused by BIF, bipartisan infrastructure, then they have no reason to support it. Vote it down. Now, the problem is that progressives aren't threatening to vote down the bipartisan infrastructure, and they're still kind of towing the same line, which was important to a point, but now it's not as valuable. So, for example, Jamal Bowman said, look, I'm a yes on both bills, but at the same time, he tweeted out, we passed what we ran on. I'm a yes to building back better for all. Both bills must pass. Now, I responded to that saying, build back better is busted. Torpedo everything you got played. Don't give their corporate donors what they want. The crumbs you got in build back better aren't worth voting on bipartisan infrastructure for. Don't be weak. Vote no. Tank it. Now, even though Jamal Bowman is in one way standing up to Nancy Pelosi by saying, no, I'm not going to vote on the bipartisan infrastructure yet. I want to vote on both bills. He's still caving by saying he's going to vote for Biff at all because it's it's a bad bill. And on top of that, Build Back Better got gutted. We talked about this last week. Paid leave was even, even removed. And you're still going to give them what they want? The bipartisan infrastructure proposal, which is a giveaway to their corporate donors. Fuck that. Vote it down. Don't give them what they want. You have no incentive now. There's not enough in Build Back Better. And by saying no, voting down both bills, you actually are showing the Democratic Party that you mean business. Why do you think Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer listen to these corporate Democrats? Why do you think they're encouraging you to vote on infrastructure? Because they know that these corporate Democrats, they mean business. They will vote down reconciliation. So to get both bills through, Nancy Pelosi is trying to appease the corporatists. But they're not trying to appease you. They kind of shut you out of negotiations on both Biff and Build Back Better because they know that at the end of the day, whatever they come up with, you're going to go along with it as long as there's a little bit of crumbs in it. So it doesn't matter how humiliated you look. So Joe Manchin, he held a press conference and he called their bluff and he basically said, look, if we don't get a vote on bipartisan infrastructure, then I'm not going to support reconciliation. Here's what he had to say. Last week, the speaker urged Speaker Pelosi urged the importance of voting and passing the BIF bill before the president took the world stage overseas and still no action. In my view, this is not how the United States Congress should operate or, in my view, has operated in the past. The political games have to stop. Twice now, the House has balked at the opportunity to send the BIF legislation to the president. As you've heard, there are some House Democrats who say they can't support this infrastructure package until they get my commitment on the reconciliation legislation. It is time to vote on the BIF bill, up or down, and then go home and explain to your constituents 
the decision you made. And I've always said, if I can't go home and explain it, I can't vote for it. And if I can, I, I will. I've worked in good faith for three months, for the past three months, with President Biden, Leader Schumer, Speaker Pelosi, and my colleagues on the reconciliation bill, and I will continue to do so. For the sake of the country, I urge the House to vote and pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Holding this bill hostage is not going to work in getting my support for rec reconciliation bill. Throughout the last three months, I've been straightforward about my con concerns that I will not support a reconciliation package that expands social programs and irresponsibly adds to our $29 trillion in national debt that no one seems to really care about or even talk about. Nor will I support a package that risks hurting American families suffering from historic inflation. Simply put, I will not support a bill that is this consequential without thoroughly understanding the impact that it will have on our national debt, our economy, and most importantly, all of our American people. Every elected representative needs to know what they are voting for and the impact it has, not only on their constituents, but the entire country. So before I get to the response from the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, Pramila Jayapal, I just want to go over some things that he said here. He said, I've worked in good faith for three months. Laughable. Absolutely laughable. On top of that, he says uh, that he will... Uh, not support a package that risks hurting American families suffering from historic inflation. He would never be able to get away with that if we had a capable mainstream media that was doing its job because he doesn't care about the American people. He doesn't care about what people in West Virginia want. If you look at the polls, these policies are incredibly popular. He's doing the bidding of his corporate overlords. And on top of that, he says, this bill will irresponsibly add to our $29 trillion national debt that no one seems to really care about or even talk about. Yeah, that's because we shouldn't care about that. I don't give a fuck about the national debt and nobody who's serious should. I care about people in this country who are suffering because dipshits like you are holding your entire party back. Even when Democrats want to do the bare minimum, we can't even get that. Can't even get a billionaire tax, can't even get four weeks paid leave, can't even join the rest of the world in offering the bare minimum to American workers. So look, if I'm a progressive and I see that, if I, if I see that he's very obviously trying to call my bluff, I'm saying, okay, keep your vote on reconciliation, Joe Manchin. We're voting no on your corporate handout disguised as bipartisan infrastructure. Fuck you. We don't need you. We're done with everything. We got nothing that we wanted. So we're going to deny you what you want so desperately for your donors too. But that's not what happened. Because Joe Manchin called the bluff of progressives in Congress and the leader of progressives back down. She basically said, well, look, <laughs> we, we really want to vote on both bills at the same time, but we're willing to vote for this bipartisan infrastructure corporate giveaway so long as the president pinky promises that we're going to get a vote on reconciliation. Take a look at what she had to say. This is just embarrassingly pathetic. You endorsed the White House framework last week, you as a group, of course. Are you confident that those two senators will be for it? Because they have been less than definitive in what they've said so far publicly. Yes, Andrea, it's good to see you. And we did endorse the framework. And in fact, we also had a very, very good meeting yesterday of the full CPC after the text was released, which is something that we were asking for for the Build Back Better Act. And I'm very happy to say that we are now awaiting negotiations among senators on prescription drug pricing and child care and uh, some details on immigration. But the Progressive Caucus, assuming good resolution of, of uh, those issues from the Senate side, that we will be excited to vote for both bills. We now feel like we have what we need. We are taking the president's word at... Um, the fact that he believes he can get 50 votes in the Senate. Um, and, you know, I hope that the two senators uh, that we've been waiting on these months um, who, who have come to the table in good faith and negotiated, that they understand that this is a leap of faith. But, uh, you know, assuming we get these, these final negotiations done, we're ready to pass uh, both bills. And I think the caucus feels very good about the fact that we've been able to do what we said from the beginning which is pass both bills at the same time, get the entirety of the president's agenda to his desk for signature and ultimately deliver transformative change for people across this country. That was absolutely pathetic. And this is why progressives don't get what they want. This is why they're not taken seriously 
during negotiations because of things like that. She said, we are taking the president's word at the fact that he believes he can get 50 votes in the Senate. And, you know, she really hopes that these two senators, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin, know that they're taking a leap of faith. That's assuming that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are good faith negotiators when Pramila Jayapal knows they are not. But what she's doing is she's buckling. And I'm going to play another clip for you in a moment where she talks about how, okay, even if the Build Back Better Act was gutted, what's in it is still good. But here's the problem with that. Uh, you're voting for what they want. So at that point, once you vote for their corporate giveaway, you no longer have leverage. So that $550 billion that's being made into climate change investments, well, what's stopping Joe Manchin after you've given him infrastructure from saying, you know what, let's cut that in half. Let's also take out the uh, universal pre-K. Let's take that out too. If he does that, what are you going to say? No, you better not. You already gave him what he wanted. You gave away your leverage. So he can do anything he wants at this point. And you've enabled that. That's why, at a minimum, you can't vote for infrastructure unless you get a vote in the Senate on Build Back Better. And also, there was a little uh, line in there where she said she was waiting to see what happens in the Senate with regard to prescription drugs. Oh, you're just waiting and crossing your fingers that everything is going to go as you plan. You fight, Representative Jayapal. You fucking fight. It's not going to go your way if you just sit back and cross your fingers and, and hope and pray that things are going to go your way. You're working against an entire industry that is trying to tank this. And it's clear that you've just decided to get steamrolled. What you said there is basically, give us whatever and we'll just go along with it because we have no fucking spines. Now, I do want to show you this um, second clip here where she made it very clear that she's she's happy with what's left of the Build Back Better Act. And um, yeah, they really hope that, um, you know, uh, the prescription drug clause is included in Build Back Better. But if it's not, I mean, we'll still vote for it. But there's a big if there. If you don't get Senate agreement on child care, immigration, pre prescription drugs, does that mean that you won't go forward? Well, I think that we are very, very close, um, is my understanding. And it isn't just the two senators at this point. There, you know, you have to get 50 votes in the Senate. So there are different senators who are, um, who are pushing very hard for different pieces. Um, of this bill, including the prescription drug pricing piece. And um, on child care, actually, is really not about the overall. It's really about the implementation details. There are some differences between the language and what the Biden framework said. Um, so we are trying to iron out those differences. But my, uh, my hope is that that will happen very quickly. And as I said, uh, you know, look, I think we're <laughs> we're in the very end zone here. We are we are just about to get this done and we're feeling very good about uh, both bills. And and, you know, and the president, frankly, being able to say once we deliver the Build Back Better Act, what a crucial time this is. You know, Boris Johnson talking about how important climate is. There's a five hundred and fifty five billion dollar investment in climate. And we spent the weekend looking at whether it would really lead to significant reductions, meaningful reductions in climate emissions. And our belief, given the detailed look that we have had and the briefings we've had from the White House, that yes, we will get there with that. And so that is a huge victory. Um, and, and that's why we think, you know, that we should pass these two bills together uh, as soon as possible. And let's wrap up these negotiations. Let's get these last things done and let's pass them through. I think we're ready. All right, so she claims that the reason why, the main reason why progressives in Congress are still enthusiastic about Build Back Better is because of the $550 billion still in that bill for climate change investment. She says that we spent the weekend looking at whether it would lead to significant reductions, meaningful reductions in climate emissions, and our belief, given the detailed look, is that yes, we will get there. The problem is that, Pramila, even if you are excited about that provision, Again, if you vote for infrastructure, Joe Manchin can say, I don't like that number. Let's make it 100 billion. And there's nothing that you can do once you've given away your leverage. And furthermore, I don't believe that that's actually going to be sufficient. I mean, of course, I have to see the details of the bill. I'm sure it's positive. But when we're talking about global anthropogenic climate change, if you think that 550 billion 
is going to be sufficient. I just feel like that is incredibly naive. In an op-ed for the New York Times, Abram Lustgarden eloquently explains why even if progressives got the full $3.5 trillion uh, investments that they wanted, which, I mean, that's still the compromise, but even if they got that, that would still be not enough given the scale of the destruction that climate change will inevitably cause. He writes, the current price tag of nearly $1.9 trillion for climate and other social spending might seem enormous, though less so than the original $3.5 trillion plan, but over the long term, either would be a pittance. By zeroing in on those numbers, the public debate seems to have skipped over the economic ramifications of climate change, which promise to be historically disruptive and enormously expensive. What we don't spend now will cost us much more later. The compromise plan calls for half a trillion dollars directed largely toward tax incentives for low emission energy sources, but it omits other provisions which will make it hard for Mr. Biden to reach his climate goals. Some economists and climate scientists have calculated that climate change change could cost the United States the equivalent of nearly 4% of its gross domestic product a year by 2100. 4% is likely a conservative estimate. It leaves out consequential costs like damages from drought and climate migration. It assumes the United States and other nations eventually move away from energy generated by oil, coal, and natural gas, though not as immediately as many say is needed. In this scenario, the planet will still warm by around 3 degrees Celsius by the end of the century from pre-industrial levels, a change that would be disastrous. 4% of American GDP comes out to about $840 billion each year. It figured on last year's economic output. Measured over a decade, the way the Build Back Better Act is framed, it's nearly $8.4 trillion. But the actual cost of climate change to the economy could easily be far greater. So we know that half a trillion isn't enough to tackle climate change. But I guess if it meets Joe Biden's meager goals, then... Pramila Jayapal, as the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, is satisfied. And it's just, it's incredibly disappointing to see how easily they will roll over for the corporate wing of the party. And you could even take things further. Okay, Build Back Better is gutted, and they still really want you to vote for their infrastructure proposal, right? Because they want that gift to their corporate donors. There's a reason why over a dozen Republicans are supporting it in the Senate as well. So if they want that, Make more demands from Joe Biden and say, look, you're clearly not going to get the votes, but if you assure us that you're going to be signing an executive order where you cancel 50000 in uh, student debt from each debt holder, if there's more executive orders that we can get from you before we vote on this, maybe we'll change our minds because what we're getting here is fucked over. We're getting crumbs and we don't accept it. But give us some more executive orders, these five executive orders, and Sure, we'll, we'll consider a change of heart. We'll consider voting on your corporate giveaway if we get the crumbs and build back better. But they're not doing anything. They're, they're just rolling over and they're dying. And this is why they will never be taken seriously in Congress. Because at the end of the day, even when they do a good job and they hold strong for a really long time, you can always expect them to buckle. And this is why change never happens in the United States. It's really, really frustrating, and it's disappointing. And honestly, if Pramila Jayapal doesn't think she can handle all of the pressure that leadership is putting on her, maybe she shouldn't be the leader of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. Because what we saw is weakness. And you just broadcasted to everyone in the country that you're willing to go back on the bare minimum that you were holding strong on. So that's incredibly embarrassing. Congressional progressives look weak and if progressives don't vote down everything, torpedo build back better and bipartisan infrastructure, I mean, they're, they're going to leave lots of young people who are hopeful that they'd get the job done feeling disillusioned. And that's going to hurt progressives in 2022. So if they let us down, they're going to be the ones to blame. I mean, Joe Manchin is clearly trying to play you and you're giving him exactly what he wants. You walked right into his trap. And that's really unfortunate. Make some demands, fight, but they're not willing to fight. And unfortunately, I'm not that surprised. I kind of expected this to be the ultimate outcome. You know, when we were talking about all of these wonderful things in Build Back Better, I was pretty skeptical that they would be accomplished. And my cynicism, unfortunately, was correct. So this is not really the surprising outcome so far, assuming it's going to head in this direction. It's just, you know, another day where progressives get fucked because they are absolutely spineless. And yeah, so Joe Manchin wins. Corporate America wins.